Take your Bibles this morning. Let's go to John chapter 19, please. John chapter 19. As we celebrate this Easter season, we must look at all that the Lord Jesus Christ went through. Adrian sang the song, Were You There? How would it change your life if you were actually at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? If you saw the man that called himself Christ, what if you were the centurion? What if you were the soldiers that nailed his wrist on the beams? What if you were the Pharisees? What if you were the, well, any crucifixion brought onlookers? Think about this. What would you have taken away from the crucifixion scene? It would have been normal because they had crucifixions almost every day in the Roman Empire. But this one was different. This one got a little bit more fanfare, I believe. Because the man being crucified was hated and despised by the religious leaders but loved by most of the common people yet we all know what happened a mob mentality they all said crucify him crucify him how quickly they changed from Hosanna Hosanna glory to the king one week later and it's crucify him this is where you notice in our today, it hasn't changed. People are very fickle. One minute they like peanut butter, the next they don't. No, just kidding. You know, we, we change our minds so frequently. One minute we like someone, and the next minute someone says something. We never investigate. We just assimilate. Isn't that amazing? I've lost so many friends, and so have you, because someone's went to them and says, and they're like, <gasps> and then they never talk to you, and you're like, what did I do? First thing I do is, you know, see if I, you know, put my underarm deodorant on today or something like that. But we've done that. And we've, from the time, there are people that were in my wedding I've never spoke to. There, there are people along that I've worked with. And you've seen that. Here's Jesus Christ. Healed some of their mothers. Raised some of their children to death. Healed their diseases. Made some people talk. Made some people see. Made some people walk. And all of a sudden they're saying, crucify him. And as I think about this, I want us to picture ourselves 2,000 years ago at the foot of the cross. And you know what I like doing is listening. I can sense a lot by how people speak. And this morning I want us to see some words from the cross. John really goes in depth on the words spoken from the cross, around the cross, and to the cross. You say to the cross. Oh yeah, there was a lot of slang. There was a lot of snickers. There was a lot of insults thrown at the cross. There was also a lot of words spoken around the cross indirectly. But there was words spoken from the cross that I want us to see this morning. As we begin reading in verse 20, and it goes beyond that, but I want us to be able to save time as well, but I want us to see some key events and things written in the Gospel of John. And in verse 20, we all know that Pilate wrote an inscription that says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It covered all bases. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to the pilot, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilot answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, therefore, amongst themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, they parteth my raiment among them, for my vesture they did cast lots. 
These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be filled, saith, I thirst. Now there set a vessel full of vinegar, and filled a sponge, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it on a hyssop, and put it in his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. Jesus therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was on the high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that it bared record, and the record was true. And he knoweth that he saith it true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be filled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we expound on these scriptures and the words that have spoken around the cross and from the cross, and as we ask questions this morning, if we stood there, what would our response be? Would we be silent? Would we speak? Would we weep? Or would we believe as the centurion did? Thank you, Lord, for your scriptures and how it is still relevant in 2023 as it was in 33 AD. Thank you for your love that you shed abroad on Calvary's cross that the world might see a Savior that loves them. Use this message, I pray, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Probably one of the most powerful words spoken in the scriptures is, it is finished. Jesus said before he bowed his head and gave up the spirit, perhaps these same words were said by Pilate and by the chief priest too. It is finished. I don't have to deal with this man anymore. Remember Pilate washed his hands and says, Let his, his blood's not on my hands. The Pharisees and priests were like, yeah, it's finished. He's going to die. Don't have to ever see him again. Well, the problem is they weren't crucifying a the man. They were crucifying God-man. How they must have swallowed a crow when he rose up from the grave and began preaching again. But, 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 can you not see them now? But here's the thing. The words, it is finished from Pilate's, would have been different than it is finished from the priest, than it is finished with Christ. They were even said by Satan. Can you imagine how glad he was when Jesus Christ was crucified? But how shocked he was when the Bible says he went down into hell and took the keys of death. Boy, can you imagine Satan? What are you doing down here? <laughs> I'm coming to claim what's mine. Taking away the sting of death and the grave. But perhaps these same words were said by our Heavenly Father when the payment of sin was made once and for all by His Son. It is finished. When Jesus finished His mission and commended His spirit and His soul to his Father in heaven, it is finished, was uttered. No more do we need religion? Do we need artifacts of religion? Idols? Rituals? We need faith. For by grace you save through faith. That's what it is all about. It is finished can mean very different things to many people. 
These same words can be said by an artist who's composed a masterpiece. It is finished. It can be said by a couple who walk away and said, our marriage is finished. It can be said by a doctor who's finished a surgery. It is finished. There are so many ways these words can be used. But it is finished. The words can mean many different things. It can be mean there's no more hope. Or it can mean there is hope. There is done. When Jesus spoke these words right before he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. He might have meant that his life is over. But also might have meant that his masterpiece is complete. Salvation is done and taken care of. His mission to bring us salvation has now been accomplished and it is finished. When you think about these words, they can be ambiguous. Their meaning determined by one thing, by faith. I have heard in my short 51 years, people saying, well, they didn't actually mean that. Or when I explain something to the Bible, it doesn't actually mean that. It's ambiguous. But what does God really mean when it is finished? I believe the scriptures are saying no more payment is needed for salvation. He paid it all. It is finished. He is the final payment for salvation. We have religions today that says, well, you need this, you need that, you need this. I was talking to somebody this week or last weekend and I noticed he was carrying a traditional rosary and he was kind of rubbing it. And he says, I'm preparing myself for Easter week. I said, I did it in 1979. I prepared myself for Easter week when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. He said, well, how do you know? And I says, let me see your rosary. I says, Christ is still on the cross. When he said it is finished, I said, my cross is empty. My grave is empty. But he says, I, I always need affirmation. I said, I need no affirmation but the word of God. These things are written that you might believe. This is religion that has confused man to where we're always unattainable for the salvation of God. It's not through man. It's through Jesus Christ, the man that gave his life. I did not give my life for your salvation. My friend's priest did not give his life for his salvation. Those little beads, no matter how many prayers he says, no matter how many times I go to church, no matter how many times I read the Bible, if I never accept those words, it is finished by faith, I will spend a Christless eternity away. We can look at our car and we can say, I know it has fuel. I know it has an engine. But you're scared to crank the engine. You have to have faith to get in the car. You have to have faith to believe the brakes. You have to have faith to believe all these electronics that it, when you turn right, it's going to turn right, not left. You know, it's these things. I had the privilege this last week of driving an old vehicle that was no power steering. I love power steering. I really do. It's like mountain roads and I'm like <laughs> trying to turn this thing. That's why the steering wheel was 15 foot long. Was, you know, so you can actually turn the things. You take for granted when you hit the brakes. I got in my truck and I was like, I hit the brakes and I hit the window. I'm like, this is great. When you look at things, things have changed. But one thing hasn't changed is faith. Faith is unilateral. Everyone has faith. We have been given that measure of faith. But what do we do with it? We are here today because we believe these words are good and true. They are more than good and true, folks. There are a lot of people celebrating Good Friday in a variety. I've got friends that have put on Facebook that they're eating fish today. They're doing all this. Hey, I love them. They asked me what I mean. I said, probably chili. They're like, chili, it's Easter. Yeah, it is. But I'm eating chili and grilled cheese, amen? It's good stuff. Just don't be come after me after, you know. <laughs> hey, we're all good. But you know, I don't have to follow man's rituals. 
I don't have to do things. I love them, but I says, listen, rituals, and I asked him, most of all, do you know if you died today, would you spend eternity in heaven? They said, well, I hope so. And I'm laughing because I was like, but you know, he said, yeah, but. There's no yeah, buts. <laughs> there is no but this, but that. And we keep, that's what we keep living the life. The words of Calvary are sure. It is finished. I don't need it. Think about this. If it were so that I needed all of rituals of my church, then the thief on the cross would have never got saved. If he were to be baptized first or after, if he were to have communion, rites, be a church goer, turn over a new leaf, everything. The man was on the cross for his sins. And he looked at Jesus and he realized he was on the cross for him. You know what he said? Today, sir, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's the greatest words. These words spoken from the cross ought to really touch us to see how simple salvation was. To us, these words are no more powerful and more inspiring, more awe-filling words than those proclaimed by Jesus on the cross right before he gave up the spirit. It is finished. Faith makes Christianity unique. It does. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our faith leads us to hear these words, not an admission of defeat, but an announcement of victory over death and hell. It is finished. At last, the victory is finally won. Sin, death, and the devil have been defeated once and for all. These simple words heard in this way describes what makes Christianity and a relationship with Christ so different from all other religions in the world. These words remind us that Christianity is not a dead religion. It is about what we do. It is about what Jesus Christ did. For us, it is not a program that helps us to find the meaning of life. It's not a set of teaching or rules that we must accept. It is not about confirmations, baptisms. It's not about rituals. It's about faith. Christianity doesn't begin with us at all. It begins with our Savior on the cross. All these years as pastor, when I talk to people about the Lord, they always go back to something they did for their salvation. I am glad that I didn't have to do anything to earn my salvation. I'm glad I didn't have to be a good person because I would have never obtained it. Jesus loved me this much. When he stretched his hands out and shed his blood on the cross for me, he was saving me as I am, just as I am, without one plea. You know, you think about this amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That was a man that was beyond help. His crew hated him, did atrocious things, but he had a mother and grandmother that prayed for him back in England. And when he wrote that after converting to Christianity and accepting Jesus Christ's price once and for all, Newton writes, how great it was to be saved. When we've been then there 10,000 years, can you even com comprehend we just begun? <laughs> the cross, it is finished. It was completed on the cross for us all. As you come to the cross with your life this morning, what is your declaration? How will you respond to the words Christ spoke about the payment of your sin on the cross? For us, our salvation begins at Jesus Christ and ends at Jesus Christ. And when is that? Never has begun and never has end. It's always had. Before the world begun, he saw us. Still created us. Still allowed us to live. Still offered us a price. That is true love. That is beyond comprehending. The cross commands our attention and challenges us in many, many ways. 
It challenges us to think about the words. First of all, we look at Pilate's words. I have written what I have written. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This fulfilled prophecy. He's proclaiming who Jesus Christ really was. You know what the Pharisee says? Well, why didn't you say, I am the King of the Jews? That's not what Jesus was. Jesus was King of the Jews. But they refused to acknowledge Him for who He was. We have a world today that refused to acknowledge Jesus Christ for who He is. When we, cry, when we walk, when we live our life and we proclaim Jesus is our Lord. People look at us and say, not mine. And you're right. He will never be their Lord until they surrender and yield their life to Him. What a difference. Oh, it's your crutch. Give me two of them. Oh, it's this. I need more of them. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. That's not a bad thing. We have decisions we're facing all throughout our day. I shared mine on Wednesday night. It's not an easy decision, but that's why I need him every hour. When we think about the words, you think about the soldiers. Hey guys, we got this Jesus of Nazareth, this King of the Jews garments. It's amazing how they probably wouldn't want a thief's garment. They probably wouldn't want the murderer's garment, but they wanted Jesus' garment. Was it beautiful? Don't know. I don't think Jesus was a flashy person. But it was unique. It was without seam. It was done from top to bottom at one time. What an amazing garment that was. And but it filled, they gambled for it. They cast lots to see who would get this great garment. And we see the words. Jesus Christ was an object. Jesus Christ was somebody to get something from. A lot of people come to church to see what they can get. I've been at church where they're pulling out business cards. Hey, I, you know, I'm a mechanic. I'm a realtor. I'm a lawyer. I'm this. I've seen it all. I'm a carpenter. I'm this. The church is not my business place. The church is my place to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Sure, in church and fellowships, we talk about our weeks, we talk about our days, but it's not a place of advertising. But here they are making the sacrifice of God a commerce. They're gambling for it. Hey, look what we got from the crucifixion. That poor guy died and we got his coat. How morbid. But that's how people, they don't care that Jesus Christ died for them. They cared about the dollar. The word spoken says a lot about our hearts. Some say Jesus is the Lord of my life. Some say, Jesus is the Lord of my life, but don't live it. You know, we think, well, he just says. We also see some of the tender words. Spoken and not spoken. Can you imagine the words of Mary? The Bible doesn't record a lot. But I can imagine a mother always gives comforting words. Doesn't record it. But I can imagine her heart was torn as she watched her son bleed. As she watched her son disfigured from the cat of nine tails. The words must have been tender. Think about the words that we hear from God's word. As a mother's voice, the Bible says, God's words are tender words. God's words help us in our life. When we're down, when we're discouraged, when we're excited, God's word meets our needs. He knows the right words at the right time. I was reading yesterday morning and God gave me some right words for the right time. Those are tender words to me. I needed them. And my heavenly father whispers these words. If I read you the verse, you're like, huh, it's a good verse, Pastor. I really like it. But it spoke to me. There were tender words for me for the hour that I'm going through. Think about 
Mother, behold your son. Her world just got turned upside down. The one she loved, her oldest son, is now being crucified. She knew that he was born to die. But no mother wants to accept the fate. But Jesus, in his pain, in his agony, looked down and saw the faithful disciple, John, and says, son, you're part of the family now. The greatest thing we could ever hear is you are now a child of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 it says he gave us power to be his child. You think about those wonderful words, welcome home son. Welcome home. That affirmation that we are no longer in the wilderness, we're no longer outside of the bounds of where God intended us to be. As we accept Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, and repent of our sins, we have now become the family of God. John was not blood. John was brought into the family. And here today, we hear the words upon accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Welcome home. Welcome home. I thirst. What words from a parched throat of a dying man? I thirst. We walk through this earth. We walk through this world and literally we thirst. And sometimes what the world gives us is bitter and putrid. But aren't you glad Jesus is there to give us the true living water? The world doesn't reciprocate with the best in kind. When we're thirsty, when we're discouraged, when we feel like we're dying inside, aren't you glad God knows exactly what to give us when the world gives us the fermented, sour things of life. I know now and then when I absolutely have to have it, I'll take apple cider vinegar and honey for my stomach. But what a face you make. You know, it, it's good, it works, but I just can't get past the vinegar. You know, it's just like, oh, the smell of it is bad enough. I washed my canteen out the other day and it is a World War II canteen and it's aluminum so it has some unique smells and who knows where it's been. So I'll wash it out each time with vinegar before just to kill anything that might be growing in there. And that first taste of water is the vinegar and it's like, oh, gross. So I'll dump it out, swish it out, get it, put some more water in there and then it's okay. But vinegar has a tendency to really make you, but vinegar done right in food, in recipes, you don't taste it. But the world has a way of giving you straight vinegar to make life more, more bearable, unbearable. But the word that Christ spoke, it is finished, meant no longer do we have to wonder, is salvation real? No longer do we wonder if salvation is sure. A lot of people today, I have friends that I know, a coins that I know, that have been taught that they may lose their salvation. I believe, and I've mentioned to them, if Christ said it was finished, and it's not finished, and you continue to lose your salvation, and His blood is not powerful enough, that He lied. I'm so glad that I don't have to go around and ask, Dad, am I your son? Dad, am I your son? Dad, am I your son? I will always be a Horton, whether He wants me to or not. Whether he wants to send me back with a stork or not. You know, I was laughing the other day. He says, don't you wish you could send me back? He goes, many times, son, you don't even know. I said, well, can I have a new father then? <laughs> We're laughing. But you know, things changed. But I will always be my father's son. I don't always be honest. I don't always feel saved. I don't always act like a Christian. I don't always do the things that I should, but it doesn't negate the fact that on December 1978, Jesus Christ saved my soul once and for all. 
if it were based on what I've done in my life, I would have been so lost I could never be found again. But I'm a prodigal son. God, save me. And that's one thing I know, for these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. I don't have to think, did he? Did he not? Did he? Did he not? That's what the devil wants to do. devil wants to make us doubt. And when he said it is finished, it was exactly done forever. But I want you to think about some very powerful words. Truly, this is the Son of God. Matthew records the centurion as he pierced Jesus Christ's side and blood and water came out. He said, truly, this is the Son of God. What we see here is an admission from a battle-hardened centurion, a squad leader admitting once and for all that this man was God. By faith, it's with our mouth we make confession. I believe that day the centurion realized he observed the crowd. He observed Jesus. He observed the conversation. The centurion generally stood relatively close to the base of the cross so that he could have a better oversight of his troops to protect against the quells of the crowd. Think about this. A sergeant, a lieutenant, all are kind of up here. In our tanks, we have a tank commander. I can't see driving like this. That's all I see. I don't see left. I don't see right. I don't see behind. But my tank commander has 360. He sees everything. The screens show everything. This is what the centurion would have been. He would see in everything. He would have heard the conversations. He would have seen his soldiers down on their knees casting lots for that garment. He would have seen the reaction of the priest. If you really are God, why don't you come down and save yourself? If you really, he would have seen the discourse. But you know what? I have no guarantee what he was seeing. The love of Jesus Christ. The tender moments between him and John and his mother. The tender moments of the discipleships. For these things were done that the scripture should be filled. Everything written here and recorded in the four gospels is showing you that everything that God promised from the beginning of time was fulfilled at the cross of Calvary through his son. As I think about these responses, I want to share these with you in closing. The centurion moved from doubt to faith. Just another criminal. Just doing my job. And he moved from doubt to faith. Truly, this is the Son of God. That day, no longer a skeptic person when it comes to Jesus. How about us? Do we have skeptics in here this morning? Are we going to move from doubt to faith? Many people say he's a good teacher. I've heard that so many. Or somebody my church taught about. But maybe today we'd like to get to know more about who Jesus is. The thief. He moved from a sinner to a saint in an instant. He moved from a thief to a son of God. Many people today, I've known of them. And I've heard stories about them. But today, are we ready to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation and become a child of the King? Maybe today, we, like the thief on the cross, have got a really bad past. But you know what? That doesn't matter with Jesus because he washes that white as snow. There's John. He moved from a friend to family. We moved from aliens to saints. Think about this. We have now a family when we accept Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. But you know, there's also Christians that never really get close to God. They've accepted Christ. They no doubt about their sinner. They realize that. They accept Christ as their personal Savior, but they never go that extra 
they're acquaintance instead of family. That's where we may be teased. I'm already a Christian, but I need to be more involved. I need to become more part of the church family as God says we are a family of God in Ephesians. Are we? Some of us serve from the outside looking in. Some serve from the inside looking out. Where would you rather be? Think about the bystanders. It says they move from spectator to servants. There's a lot of people looking at religion. Looking at Oh, I don't need religion. You're right. We don't need no more religion. We need more relationships. It's time for us to quit sitting on the sidelines and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior and get involved. Time is short. You know, you think about this. I, I pulled out of the garage today and says, well, this may be our last Easter in this house. You know, I don't know where tomorrow, it may be the last Easter on this earth. The Lord could come before next Easter. Even so come quickly. Amen. But we don't know about that. I may pass away in a car wreck. I may turn a tank over on myself. I don't know. You know. I, I do a lot of crazy things during the week. I don't know what's happened. We're guaranteed no time. But how will my time be? I'll never forget that message I heard. It's not my birthday. And it's not my death date. It's the dash on how we lived. It's that dash. As I walked the other day, I had to do some things a couple weeks ago and I saw something on the outside of my office. And I went and checked it. And I just walked through the graveyard. It was a beautiful day, a little cold. And I just saw all the people that were laying since 1822 in this graveyard here. And I wondered, how did they live? How did people remember them? Each day we have a choice on how we respond and how we live. How do people remember us? But you think about two people that's not mentioned at the cross, but they were mentioned after the cross. Joseph. Joseph was a very powerful man. And after Jesus Christ died, he gave him his tomb. He came out and went to Pilate and says, we need him. I want his body in my tomb. You know what it said? He moved from secrecy to boldness. He no longer hid behind the shadow. He was no longer a chameleon Christian. He became a believer. And there's a lot of us this morning. Maybe we need to move from being a chameleon to a real, I'm a child of God. I'm not ashamed of it. It's time. We need to be bolder. We need to publicly declare our faith in Jesus by our actions and by our deeds. Words spoken at the cross are important. They're recorded forever. People need to hear the words, but see the actions of our life. And finally, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he found Jesus Christ in the middle of the night. He, are you the rabbi? Are you the Messiah? Are you the person I'm seeking? But you never hear much about him until after. He moved from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. Verses 38 to 42 all talk about Joseph and Nicodemus and how they besought Pilate that might take away the body of Christ. It's time for all of us this Easter season to take our faith to the next level. We ought to want to learn more we ought to learn to grow deeper and closer to God. And we ought to get more out of our walk. I believe God's going to be working on me this Easter. Really testing my faith. Making me grow deeper. I don't know. I do not know what tomorrow holds. I do not know where tomorrow will take me. But I know who holds tomorrow. These are things, the older you get, I like quiet. I like settled. I like knowing what's ahead of me. But when I don't, it unnerves me. But that's where I have to let go and let God. Because it's already written. 
God's a sovereign God and my life has already been written. He already knows when I'm going to die. He knows tomorrow. He knows 20 years from now. He knows when Brian and I are going to have a wheelchair race. You know, we, we look at life. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I know that God has sustained this family. And he will continue to sustain, sustain as long as we as community stay faithful to his word. And this is when you look at his words. The greatest words that we can ever preach are words written in the Bible. They are finished. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. Just as my salvation is settled in the Lamb's book of life. The greatest thing we could ever know is that assurance. That on that cross, Jesus Christ paid for your sins and mine once and for all. We don't have to doubt it. We don't have to second guess it. We just have to believe it. That it is finished. We can be a John. We can be a bystander moving from spectator to servant. We can be Joseph moving from secrecy to boldness. To spiritual embassy to spiritual maturity for Nicodemus. We can be a thief moving from sinner to a saint. There are so many things and the reason they are is because words were spoken around the cross that touch these people's life. Think about the centurion going back to the praetorium. Truly I met the Savior today. This crucifixion was unlike any I've ever attended. This crucifixion touched my heart and changed me. You would never believe what I saw. We truly crucified the Son of God. Three days later, can you imagine the centurion when the word got around the praetorium? Oh, it did. <laughs> Soldiers talk. Hey, that man we crucified on Wednesday, he arose on Sunday. How do you know? Well, the guys that are under you, they all fainted when the rock rolled away. They saw an angel. They, and his tomb was empty. Can you imagine how that army base rang with the truth when they heard the man they crucified is not dead anymore. He's alive. How do we as Christians know he's alive? Because he lives in my heart today and he lives in yours. Do you believe in the cross and the words of the cross? If not, today is a good day to accept the finished work on the cross of Calvary. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the words spoken around the cross and those that heard, those that turned from, and those that turned to. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for how it continues to minister to our hearts today. Have your will and way in our lives. Then, Lord, may we live that life. May we go from a casual Christian. May we go from a person that knows of God to one that lives for God and become a sold out child of God in these days we live in. Godly parents, Godly husband and wife, godly children living a life for our Savior in heaven. Thank you for all you've done for us. Dismiss with your blessing. Bring us out Easter morning as we celebrate a risen Savior. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Look forward to seeing each and every one of you Sunday morning at 1030. We're going to have the Sunday morning at 9 and 1030. There will be no Sunday evening service. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you Easter morning. Lord bless and have a great day.